You will now enter the conference. Illinois Guide by Your Side. This is my Pay It Forward presentation on increasing pediatric hearing aid use with telesupport. This presentation was originally presented by Elizabeth Princeton and Karen Munoz from the Utah State University at the Eddy National Conference in Kentucky um, this past March. So what Karen and Elizabeth, they did a small case study with four families. They shared their findings at this conference that I had attended. They wanted to use telesupport to address hearing aid support and how they can be supportive of families in helping them address the issues that are getting in the way of a child using their hearing aids in a consistent way. They wanted to see how they could impact hearing aid use by monitoring data logging on a more consistent and structured way. So what they wanted to do was they wanted to find out, you know, why it was important to look at hearing aid use. And what they were coming across frequently is that parents were always challenged on how to keep hearing aids on their small children. And on average, hearing aid use um, for kids ages birth to four is only four hours a day with data logging. So what Elizabeth and Karen did, um, they sent out a survey to 349 audiologists or got surveys back from 349 audiologists and they wanted to find out what was happening in their clinics and offices. What were the experiences? What were they coming across? And what the audiologists reported was that 81% um, of them used, um, would be checking the data logging on the child's hearing aid to see how long they were wearing the hearing aids on a daily basis. And of those that were checking data, 91% um, were actually sharing that information with the parents. But what they found was that over half of them, of the parents would become defensive when the audiologist would share that information with the parents, that the parents felt that they needed to come up with reasons or excuses of why or, or challenges of why, they weren't, why it was difficult for them to keep the hearing aids on their children each day. Um, they, the audiologist also reported that um, they spent a lot of their time on each of their appointments um, trying to help the parent um, teach them to address um, how to keep the hearing aids on, on their children. Um, they also shared that um, parents were needing to share this information um, with other people because their kids weren't with them all day with the parents. They might be with grandparents or nannies, babysitters, teachers. So they needed to teach others. Anita Mazik has arrived. And 70% of the audiologists shared that they too needed more training on how they could help parents find solutions in keeping the hearing aids on children. So what they did was they had looked at other healthcare management issues, and I think they brought up the, um, um, the example like diabetes, and they found out that if um, you did motiv motivational interviewing or calling, you know, your patients, that the success would be much greater in the issue that you're trying to solve. And the frequency of monitoring and checking the families had a great impact because audiologists knew that they're only seeing their, these families and these kids maybe every two months or four or six months. So the concerns and issues that parents were having with um, keeping the hearing aids on their children was only being discussed you know, these, during these appointments. So what they did was they um, did a case study with these four families. Um, they were able to connect remotely with the child's hearing aids from has arrived. To see how long the kids were wearing the hearing aids. And then the audiologists, um, Elizabeth and Karen, they were able to offer support over the phone or Skype to the parents that, that they were working with. So what they did was um, their monitoring approach, um, they were thinking like a six-month period and how often were they going to check in with the families. So in the beginning, they were calling the families weekly until um, there was consistent use um, with the hearing aids. And um, Elizabeth said sometimes she even called two or three times, you know, during those first couple weeks, you know, to help the parents 
talk about the issues and try to find ways that they could help, um, you know, with the hearing aids and keeping them on, on their child. And then once consistent um, use was being, um, the hearing aids were on, then there was a maintenance period. The audiologist would um, call like every two weeks. And once that was going well, then they would call in just once a month during their final monitoring. So here's just a real short summary of the four families. The first family, um, he was a two-year-old and um, had some behavioral issues, and he did increase wearing um, his hearing aids from six and a half hours to 10 hours a day. The second um, family had a two-month-old but had additional disabilities, and they were documenting the right and left he um, hearing aids separately because there was um, a difference. Um, however, at the end of the study, um, the right hearing aid still remained a challenge um, for them to keep the hearing aid for, um, longer than the 7.4 hours a day, but the um, left hearing aid did increase up to 11.6 hours. And the third and fourth family, they were still in progress working with them and they didn't share the information um, as to where they were at with them. So there was feedback from the, the parents that they were working with. You know, in the beginning, of course, there was the struggles on trying to keep the hearing aids um, on their child. But then as they worked with their audiologist and um, were able to discuss the, any issues or what was stressful for them, that helped the parent, you know, work on different ideas, um, you know, that week with their child. And then having that support and the audiologist um, calling them um, really helped them. And they felt more empowered, more confident that they were meeting their child's needs. And the audiologist, um, Elizabeth, she said that challenges that she had in the beginning was the equipment. Um, it was difficult to get that all set up in their office and in the, in the family's home. And the Skype didn't work very well, so they ended up dropping that and just talking with the families over the phone. Um, scheduling was difficult for Elizabeth. She said, you know, they had to get into a routine of calling the families, you know, once or twice that first week and, and just every couple weeks. And also counseling. Um, she herself admitted that she's not a parent. So she said it was difficult for her too. I mean, of course she knows the importance of keeping hearing aids on the child, but as a parent, they know what's going on in their household, you know, with other things that are going on with two, two year olds. And that, and of course the benefit was, um, was, you know, seeing the parents, you know, gain the confidence, you know, to work through any type of issues and the child wearing the hearing aids longer, as well as um, resolving, you know, any of these problems. So what they hope to do next is, um, is to take the information and work with the early intervention um, staff um, because you know, this information and connecting with family, families on a more frequent basis and that they have seen success. And, and with the early interventions, working with them on, more on a weekly basis or in their homes, they felt that that would be a, a, a great direction to go with this study. Okay, is there any questions? Yes, this is Anita. I have a question. Um, okay, um, th I'm curious. Uh, you were talking about the left and the right ear, um, and one was six hours and one was 11 hours. Uh, what was the difference? Was it one one had less hearing than the other, or less? He you know, one had worse hearing loss. I was wondering if you could expound upon that a little bit. This is Jacqueline. Yes, um, what they said was um, that this little two-month-old, he had additional disabilities, and one was a feeding issue, and I believe he had a G-tube. So when the mother would feed him, um, he was laying on his right-hand side. So therefore, she would be taking his hearing aid out, his right one out more frequently during the day. Um, so that's why um, the data logging showed that he wasn't wearing the right one as, as often as the left one. So the mom knew the importance of keeping the hearing aids in on the left side, but maybe due to the squealing and feedback, she was taking the right one out more frequently. Okay, I understand. Any other questions? I this is Anita again. I have another one. 
Um, I'm really uh, motivated uh, to try to understand about the children, their struggles with um, accepting using a hearing aid and asking the audiologist how uh, they can manage the acceptance of a hearing aid and what the issues are. Like, is it painful for the ear, like having it in, or they're just not used to the sound? Or like, what are the issues for the children? What, you know, what makes it a struggle? So I would like to know a little bit more about that. It, this is Jacqueline. I don't recall all the issues that they went into in that um, because they were working the two families, was a two-year-old and then the two-month-old, and I don't recall what the other two ages were because those were still in progress. So it seemed like the two-year-old, it was just being the rambunctious um, this and maybe, um, I mean, they said there were some behavioral issues, but they didn't go into that. So I'm not quite sure, except, um, and that's what the Elizabeth had said as an audiologist. It was difficult for her to, um, you know, know what a, a normal two-year-old, all the issues that you have with a two-year-old, and then putting hearing aids on top of that. So. Mm, okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? All right, thank you. So the post questions. Question number one. Parents report experiencing challenges and problems when having their child wear his or her hearing aids consistently, true or false? Okay, question two. Question number two. When was the monitoring of the families completed? A, weekly until the hearing aid use is consistent during the problem solving period. B, every two weeks during the maintenance period. Three, once per month during the final monitoring. Or D, all of the above. Question three. Question number three. On average, how many hours are children birth to four years of age wearing their hearing aid per day? A, two hours. B, four hours. C, eight hours. D, 12 hours.
question. Question number four. This case study was conducted with 12 families. True or false? Okay, let's go ahead and pause the recording. Back up to one. I put in a second title slide, so it should be right after your pretest. All right, so my name is Krista Jeanette with God by Your Side, and I am representing Singing for the Brain, which was originally pre um, given at the Eddy Conference in Louisville, Kentucky, by Judith Odendahl and Barbara Myers. So um, the basics, they started off by listing all of these benefits of music and singing with your child. I really wish I would have known all this before. I probably would have definitely enrolled my child in the kinder music. Um, but one thing that was neat is this is the one time that the right and left brain are both engaged. Um, some activities you can do both. Also, music and singing for an overall development, even talking about like the endocrine system and other parts of your body that are affected with it. Obviously, speech. Um, social singing, how that social, the social part of your brain um, is also stimulated during music. Um, even with music and spatial reasoning, it was listed in a book that was listed about how it even enhances a child's mathematical and science abilities. Um, and then even obviously with learning the songs and the words. And she continues to go on with other benefits, talks about, of course, it's fun. It can be used to cue routines. I'm sure many parents have done, you know, this is the way we brush our teeth and make up your own um, little songs for making smoother transitions. Invites children to become active participants, you know, once they've heard it for a while. Um, develops their listening skills, trying to figure out what comes next. Helps develop and promote auditory memory. And I'm sure um, I know this is a, a pretty general weak area that I saw even in my own daughter about um, that she needed a lot of repetition on things like this. So this would definitely promote this area. And then focuses on things even like the pitch and rhythm and intonation and dura duration, really focusing on those things. Enhances speech perception. Helps develop breath flow and control. And helps avoid excessive nasality and a strained voice. Provides opportunities for practicing sounds, words, phrases, and word order, because they're hearing more natural flow of speech there, thinking of it as a phrase. Um, and what they did is they broke down the different stages that you go through uh, starting out young. And so the first stage that they talked about was setting the stage. So in using that, using your music or things like that, using a little sing-song voice, uh, even just with natural um, daily routines that you go over, repeating favorite songs over and over. And we've got a list of several songs a little bit later on, the basic ones that we know. But even with motions, because they talk a lot about how the movement and the singing together and how that stimulates so many different parts of their brain and their body, using different motions, uh, having the baby in your lap. and swaying back and forth or jostling them up and down um, and uh, for, for making sure they have music boxes and musical toys and even the kids, their own little instruments that they can use. And, of course, you can make them, you know, what everybody knows with oatmeal containers and all kinds of different fun things like that. Incorporating music throughout the day, um, create songs about typical daily routines and create songs related to establishing play routines. So this would be just sort of the first stage introducing music to them. The next day would become your own muse. 
so this is where you take that faith, that familiar song you've introduced to them when they were 10, 12 months old. And obviously, um, for our deaf and hard of hearing children, we will be, you know, including possibly sign and making sure they're within visual um, eye contact of us. But then now you're making, changing the words to it or making up your own little song then for about, um, this is the way we pick up our toys or whatever it is. I'm sure we've all sung the Barney song over and over. Um, a use of variety of tunes so that you don't always, you know, fall back on the same one, singing about things as far as a time frame and keeping it short and simple. Obviously, it needs to be repetitive. It needs to be something that's um, a little quippy so they can uh, remember it and simple. Be sure to consider the child's language needs, what are maybe they have a weak area in labeling things in the house or whatever routine that you're wanting to introduce. Repeating the same, same, the same sounds, words, or phrases. Um, of course, we always know the book that that's not my doll or that's not my cow and the same kind of songs that have the same routine um, and making sure that there's actions or props. And that was one thing that was really neat in their presentation is they had all of these videos. She wasn't, we weren't able to include it in this because of HIPAA but um, how they use props. And so the parents would be encouraged through this different kinds of therapy that they would have a bucket. And in the bucket, they would have different kinds of little toys. So if you were doing Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star, you would get out a star or a little bus. If you're going to sing the wheels on the bus go round and round. So the kids able to put that together and guess what's next. And as they got older, they would be able to wait a little bit to see if they knew what was coming. Could they start singing that? And, um, you know, with those props and using a little bit of a pause, I think that's probably hard for us moms as we're so busy that we jump in there to help them with something, but using that dramatic pause to see, do they know what's next and can they fill in what would happen? Then the next one becomes a little bit more exciting with the dress rehearsal is what they call it, where the child becomes a more active active participant, maybe that you're imitating what you see and you see that they're starting to figure out what comes next, the recognition or even discrimination about your song and how it sounds different and I'm gonna I'm gonna pick out and I know that this little prop then goes with this. And then um the next stage then is the emerging singer and this is a fun one where the child begins to use their own singing voice now to fill in parts of a song or that they are, you know, starting to sing simple songs, it builds their own vocabulary and structures, and they call it on to the Grammys, where they're able to go on to those harder level things. And the child is singing most of the melody or and some or all of the words now. And then they're able to move on to complex language structures within the song as the child begins to sing more of the lyrics on their own. And then, of course, the fun part is when you hear your child where they're starting to change it and make up their own songs and you see their own creativity is able to start emerging um, during this time. So she puts down some different signs of listening so that you can make sure that they're right there with you. Um, obviously, when they're young, you're going to look for different subtle changes like changes in facial expression. And... Um, or even maybe they calm to the music and they pause a little bit to listen for what's changing. Um, maybe they even quiet or they stop what they're doing to see what's going on. Um, even for those that are obviously have different kinds of aids and things like that, turn to find the source of the sound. Um, and then increases body movement. So. They're moving to the music where the music stops is the child moves their body to indicate they want more and that they're ready for the next thing. And, of course, the cooing and where they're trying to add in to, to songs and things like that. Or maybe even they point to their ear, I hear that, or things like that to show that they are definitely with you and enjoying the music. And here we have a list of just the basic songs that you can take and obviously teach them at the first stage of it. And, you know, the wheels on the bus go round and round or the teddy bear song. And, that, of course, those are great because they're even teaching um, whether to be sign language or parts of the body or things like that, even just coordination things. 
And then as they get knowledge of that one, then, of course, that next stage, then they're able to take those songs and change them into words and be silly with it a little bit and uh, make up their own thing that goes along with it. Overall, it was really, really great. I wish I could have a do-over of um, my uh, of Abby's early years or have another baby maybe. Um, but and go through and just sing more and use that time to introduce a lot of, for that auditory memory and for new vocabulary and things like that, that I would be able to use that because it was, it was a definite eye-opener. Any questions? I know I went through that fast. I realized we had one more to go. All right. Well, I think that we might be ready then for our post test. Um, Thank I, you. I do I do have one question. I missed the first part about uh the 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 brain depending on the um hearing skills and um how the brain works determining those uh, making, you know, how it hears and then bilaterally in the brain. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about that? I just missed that beginning part. Well, they didn't really address as far as a lot of, like, the different levels of hearing. They just talked about how that music and singing stimulates the left side of your brain and the right side of your brain at the same time. Okay. All right. Specifically with hearing loss as well. Like let's say they couldn't hear out of one side of, you know, let's say they couldn't hear out of the left side, then would it, then would the other side of the brain receive that and vice versa? And particularly if they were aided with their loss? Well, to be honest, they didn't go on. This is one of those ones that they just had 30 minutes. So between that and they had numerous videos. And of course, these are all children with hearing loss that are on this video. Um, but they didn't go, she went quite quickly on everything, uh, maybe not quite as fast as I did, but um, she did go quite quickly. So it didn't really get in-depth into hearing loss versus that. She just pretty much hit that it was a left and right brain stimulation, not really a case-by-case. Case. Oh, okay. Okay, great. All right. Yeah, I just missed that beginning part, so thank you for clarifying. Sure. All right, any other questions? All right, thank you so much. I think we're ready for the post-test. All right, Krista, so go ahead and ask those now. Yes, please. Okay. Number one, true or false, one of the downfalls of singing is that it only stimulates one side of the brain. Question two, please. Which one of these is not a benefit of singing with your child? A, develops listening skills. B, helps develop and promote auditory memory. B, helps develop breath flow and control. D, helps free up a parent's time. Question three, please. Number three, one of the signs of an emerging singer is the child may begin to make up their own songs, true or false.
Great. Question four, please. Which one is not an idea for becoming your own muse? Letter A, choose a familiar tune or make one up. B, keep it lengthy. C, use a variety of tunes. Or D, sing about the here and now. Okay, Lydia, if you can pause the recording. This is Melissa Asbury. I'm a parent guide with. My name is Melissa Asbury. I'm a parent guide with Illinois Guide by Your Side. I attended the conference down in Louisville, Kentucky, and um, sat in on a presentation of hearing aid management, um, parent education, and support. This presentation was originally presented by Steffi Russ and Karen Muniz, both of the Utah State University. So first, auditory experience, duration, and quality all influence the outcome of how a child and how a child is going to experience the hearing aid. But there are also challenges such as their behavior, their parents' confidence, their acceptance of their hearing aids, or cochlear implants, emotions, behavior, multiple caregivers, and all of these affect how their hearing aids are used and how long they will keep them in. Um, routinely, it is seen that four hours is the average of what children wear the hearing aids from birth to four years of age. Um, <clears throat> Karen and Steffi did a, um, a survey of, I don't remember how many families they did a survey with, but they did it with, I believe, several audiologists in the area, so it's not just their own, um, to get a parent's perspective of what they, um, what they want to get from their audiologist. So this slide is actually just giving us the demographics of um, what the average age of children were for, for the survey, which is about 23 months. Um, most of them have been using their hearing aids for about 15 months. 30% um, um, of the families surveyed had um, additional disabilities, and 81% of them um, had spoken language as their communication. And then we also see that the degree of hearing loss varies from being mild to mild to severe to severe profound with the percentages seen. So information that was most frequently desired by the families to the audiologist through the survey was that um, most of them, the biggest thing that they always ask about is how to find financial help with getting hearing aids and testing done for their children. Um, second of all was trying to find out what exactly the child could or could not hear, um, what they could or could not hear with their hearing aids and without the hearing aids. So that was pretty even. Um, all parents, I think, are curious as to what exactly their children hear. Um, they're also curious on how to get loaner hearing aids. Not all audiologists have loaner hearing aids for parents to use if something should happen and it needs to be sent in for repairs. And how to help their child hear noises. So skills that um, were most frequently desired are how to do hearing aid maintenance, um, how to keep the hearing aids on the child, and how to teach other people, such as caregivers, um, the skills that they've learned with the hearing aids. 25% of the parents 
surveyed says that they didn't that they did not have the tools to be able to check the devices to make sure that they were functioning properly. So the top challenges that were encountered with hearing aid use were the child's activities, the child's resistance, which both are pretty even right there. The fear of losing hearing aids. I know that was my biggest fear when my child got her hearing aids, so I made them very bright so I could always find them. Um, the frequent feedback, just because your parent, the parent's hearing the feedback doesn't always mean that the child hears it. So that was a big fear with most of the families. Um, knowledge of other caregivers, distractions from other children, and getting into a routine. So in this survey, they also noticed that 35% of hearing aids are used less than eight hours a day. I don't know if I could go through the world with only hearing eight hours a day or less. So with this survey, it gave them the information and opportunities to be able to try to improve. So what the parents wanted was to how to meet other parents. And pediatrics audiologists don't routinely try to offer families opportunities or resources to meet other families. They pretty much just take care of the ears and the hearing aids and you're in and you're out and be at your next appointment. Um, option for financial assistance um, is definitely a want of parents and not all pediatric audiologists have the resources of where they can go to be able to get financial assistance. And the same is, and it's the same with um, access to loan or hearing aids. And this was very stunning to me that most parents wanted to know how to do their hearing aid maintenance. And pediatric audiologists do not routinely teach parents how to do maintenance on the hearing aids, which I was baffled by. So with this survey, the pediatric audiologist reported that majority of the reasons that they saw for not being able to do a lot of the things that were asked is because um, they don't teach the skills to the fathers because they usually don't come to the appointment. And it's really hard to be able to teach other caregivers because they don't come for the appointment. Um, there was also um, a few slides about training to screen for depression and anxiety. Um, this is on here because most mothers who have new children who are newly diagnosed with hearing loss, um, every time they go to a doctor's office or the pediatrician's office, they have this screening tool that they have to answer these questions. And so the pediatric audiologists were, were reporting that they didn't feel comfortable doing this and they were being asked to do so. Um, and not all pediatric audiologists collaborate with early intervention or speech and language pathologists. Does anyone have any questions? If there's no questions, then I think we'll proceed to the post-test. Question number one. Does duration and quality influence the auditory experience? True or false? Question two. Question number two. Do, audiolo do audiologists routinely teach hearing aid maintenance? True or false?
Question three. Number three, which of the following are considered challenges for hearing aid use? A, child behavior. B, parent confidence. C, acceptance. D, emotion. E, multiple caregivers. Or F, all of the above. All right, looks good. Go ahead and stop the recording.